talking small about big data, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of my favorite methods for thinking about big problems, and they're called projection methods. Um, and and uh, projection methods are really good at helping us focus on where to look for answers to questions, or as I say, they're looking for answers in the right places. And I want to illustrate that by thinking about a particular kind of question first. Uh, so say, for example, we have a group of people and they're standing around and, you're, and the question is we're interested in identifying all of the people that are within a certain distance of each other. We can call that like a thresholded uh, distance problem. And uh, this didn't take very long, but this is where the talk is going to get a little silly already. <laughs> and I'm going to need some help because I would like to illustrate this idea uh, using uh, this interactive technology called reality, you might have heard of. <laughs> but I need your help, though. So I'm going to need like, like eight people or so to come up here and help me. So you know, you guys, this is like a comedy club. You should know not to sit in the front, <laughs> right? So all you guys, I'm going to need you. I need two people to hold this board, maybe over here, like one, come on, nobody's standing up. Come on, I need lots of people here. Give me a break. Hold this board, hold that end. Somebody else has to hold the other end, okay? It's, it, actually, it's too long. You don't need, you could fold this back. There we go. And then I need like five or six people to mill around over here. And then, let's see. We're gonna, yeah, put you in a group. But wait, I have to plug this in. Random walk? Uh, no, 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 you're gonna stay still once we get in position here. Just bear with me for a second. Uh, all right, this is a very bright light, so don't look at it. Uh, but yeah, so what I, what's going to happen is uh, I want to, okay, that's maybe, let's see, it might be because it's blocked. No, it's, can you come towards me a little bit? Because what we're going to do is mark where your shadows are on that board. But the board, keep the board back, right? So that's, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Now I need somebody to hold this light, and I'm going to go, okay, yeah, Kirk will hold the light. shadow may be a little larger. Is that the problem? Okay. Yeah, that was it. Um, all right, so can I see? Okay, can you get so I can see your shadows, but, but not so that it's all... Try and stand sideways so I can... There we go. Chris, all right, Chris, AT&T. So where's your shadow? Here? I can't see it, right? Yeah, there you go, Chris. So this is Chris. And uh, Mike, you're like... Which one are you? You're this one. Mike, whose shadow is, is this? What's your name? Employee. How do you say? B-U-Y-I. B-U-Y-I. What? How, how do you say it? B-O-Y. B-O-Y. OK. And then. It's an extra I. Oh, after or before? After. after. OK, there we go. I'm sorry. Uh, I got you, Mike. Wait, you were right next to him, though. What's your name? Joyce. Joyce. So this is Joyce. And also. Martin? Okay. Marty? Do you go by Marty? Okay. That's good. So I've marked, that's good. Five shadows. That's good enough. Now, wait, don't go yet. Don't go. Uh, stay there. Now, but can you guys rotate this so everybody can see it a little bit? Um, so now I want to think about answering questions like this. Um, but rather than looking at the people, I would like to look at their shadows and see if, how far we can get to answer a question like that by looking at their shadows. And the first thing to notice is that we lose a lot of information. Like uh, B-O-I-Y, boy how do you say it? Boy-y? Boy-y and... B-Y-E-E, double E, okay. Boy-y and Joyce look like they're really close. Their shadows are really close together, but they were standing farther apart than, than you can see from their shadows, right? And the same is true to a lesser extent of Mike and Marty. So we've lost some information uh, by going from the people to their shadows. Uh, plus, you can barely read my scrawl on that. However, however, there is something we can say. As long as the lamp, you can turn it off, Kirk. That's, that's good. It's probably burning your hand, right? It's like it's like 300 watt bulb. Yeah. So um, um, what we can say, though, as long as the lamp is perpendicular to the whiteboard. We can say that the distance between two people is at least as big as the distance between their shadows. Uh, it may, they may be closer together, we don't know, but we know they're at least that far apart or farther, right? That's what we can say, as long as we have the light and the whiteboard at right angles. Okay, thanks everybody, you did great. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so, um, now it may occur to you that uh, we were in a kind of a constrained space there. Can you unplug that, Kirk? Thanks. Um, if we're trying to 
so why, why would we look at something like that? What we would want to do is, remember, we want to see how, which people are within a certain distance next to each other, right? So by looking at their shadows, the hope is we can at least rule out a bunch of people as being too far apart. That's the idea. And so it might occur to you that uh, we might want to rotate the lamp and the whiteboard around the data. That's right, I just called all you guys data. Um, <laughs> and, and see if we can get a maximum spread of their shadows, just like this. Um, and uh, this is basically the idea behind principal components, more or less. Uh, and I use that tool all of the time. And again, the hope is that uh, by looking just at the shadows, we can rule out a large amount of the data so that we can focus our search for an answer to the question on a smaller set of data and make the problem easier. Now, it seems simple, I hope, anyway. Like, almost like, why are you telling me this thing that's almost obvious? It's really, really simple. But that's what's so cool about it. It is a really simple idea. And that's why I love projection methods so much. But here's the real reason why these methods are powerful. In a room this size of about 150 people, between every two people in this room, there are over 11,000 distances between all of us in this room. But between our shadows, at least in a one-dimensional projection, there are only about 700 or 750 so uh, uh, distance measurements between the shadows, uh, uh, comparisons that we need to make to rule out shadows. And that's a big difference, and that difference grows uh, tremendously as the size of the data grow. It's basically a comparison of n squared versus n log n. Uh, so as data sizes get large, looking at shadows can really cut down the size of the problem. Uh, some friends of mine and I have been thinking about these problems over the last six months or so, and we wrote a paper, and there's an R package. It's not on CRAN yet, uh, but it's up there on GitHub, uh, GitHub called uh, T-Core for thresholded correlation. And that package is uh, very efficient at computing uh, thresholded correlation and distance matrices uh, for data. And I'll give you a real world example of how you might use it. I downloaded from the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, which is a, a genomic repository of cancer data uh, curated by the National Institutes of Health, uh, a matrix of uh, tumor samples of DNA methylation data. And the matrix is uh, 80 rows by about 400,000 columns. It's a really, really fat matrix. It's got tons of columns. And the question I wanted to ask of those data uh, was find all of the columns that were really correlated with each, with each other. Um, and this uh, in the Pearson correlation sense. For example, uh, with a Pearson correlation greater than 0.99. And, and this type of problem I've seen come up in all kinds of disciplines. Uh, finance, uh, genomics, uh, in where Max works, it comes up in uh, high throughput screening problems as a precursor to many machine learning algorithms. It's a very, very, very common question that's asked. And using this T-Core package, uh, you, can solve, you can answer that question with that data set in about eight minutes on a decent server. Um, but perhaps even more importantly, you can solve that fairly computationally intensive problem on a laptop, if you're willing to wait a little bit longer. I, I did it on a MacBook Pro, and it only took about two and a half hours. And so this is the gist of my talk. Looking at data in the right way so that you can take seemingly large or intractable problems and turn them into something that's much smaller and easier to compute. That, that, that's the gist of, and, and it'll all be through projection. Um, to illustrate, a, 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 this is actually the same idea, but in a completely different context, uh, these colleagues of mine, Jim Baglama, Fenyu, Reichel, Rodriguez, they have an algorithm that doesn't have a name, so it's just the Baglama, Fenyu, Reichel, Rodriguez algorithm uh, for very efficiently computing um, measures of network centrality, communicability, and betweenness of large-scale graphs. Uh, it's a sound, very different sounding problem, but the ideas behind the problem are the same things we just used for the uh, distances and correlations. Um, and it's a really beautiful series of papers and, and a result. And actually, so there's a funny thing. Um, last night, um, I, I prepared this example last night, of course, <laughs> um, for those of you who know me. Uh, but my intention actually was to dedicate it to David. Where are you? David. Uh, because, um, because he works at Stack Overflow. However, between the few bourbons we had last night and my complete ignorance of computer stuff, I confused Stack Overflow with Slashdot, which is actually owned by a competitor of Stack Overflow. 
Um, but I still want to dedicate the example to David because he knows a lot more about network analysis than I do, and he's much better at this kind of thing. But, um, uh, but so I downloaded it. So Stanford has this SNAP uh, catalog of uh, networks that everybody can go download, uh, download really interesting networks and play with. And last night I downloaded the uh, a, a slash dot um, follower network, uh, which is a directed network. Uh, and it has about, eight, the example's old, it's from 2009. It has about 80,000 uh, nodes and approximately a million edges. So it's a m modest sized graph. It's not super huge, but it's not that small either. Um, and the question I would like to ask of these data is, what are the five most important nodes in this network as measured by uh, Kleinberg's uh, hub authority method for determining node importance, which is a, a standard way of looking at directed graphs. And I was able to answer that question on a crappy laptop in about half a second using projection methods, using the, the, the Boglama uh, uh, algorithm. And uh, could you guys refresh this one? This is the one, press the control R. Sorry, JJ, we have to fix this, but <laughs> AB guys, can you do control R over there to refresh my, uh, there we go, thanks. There we go, okay. So here's a plot of the, a visualization of the result of that, and I plotted it using 3JS, and um, I, I uh, made it into clusters with iGraph using a, 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 some sort of graph component algorithm, and I colored it into three, three groups. The bigger, the bigger circles are um, the hubs, and the smaller ones and the edges are the, uh, a subset of the nodes that are important that are connected to those hubs. It's not the, it's not the whole network, because it would be too hard to visualize. Um, but again, uh, by thinking about the problem using projection methods, you can solve it very, 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 very efficiently. Um, that is not in an R package, but I will put the code that I used, which is pretty ugly, but I'll put the code that I used to compute that up on a GitHub page that's associated with this talk, and you guys can go download it and play with it. Now, a different use of projection methods that you're probably all more familiar with is to squish data, like to compress it by removing redundancies, um, and maybe also to approximate the data. Uh, and this is often what people use principal components for. And obviously, when you compress data, it's smaller and hopefully easier to solve problems with after that. But an interesting aspect of this that I would like to bring to your attention that often uh, people don't think about is that approximating data can in some circumstances really improve the quality of the answers to the questions that you're asking uh, through a general concept called regularization, which is the field of study that I used to be involved with, and I don't want to get too much into it, but I, I do want to show you a really simple example of this. There are equations, I'm sorry, I was trying to do an equation-free talk, but here are some simple equations. I think we can all get through these simple linear systems of equations. Um, so here, for example, is a linear system of algebraic equations uh, that has a solution of two zero, right? So this is, where, this is like, uh, we magically know the exact problem and its solution. In the real world, data are often noisy somehow. They, you know, the measurements are bad or we don't know things approximately. So for example, let's say the right-hand side there, uh, one zero, is measured and it has some tiny perturbation. It's very close to, to the exact right-hand side of one zero. We've just added a tiny bit of noise to it. And the problem that we want to solve is at the bottom. We would like to solve that linear system for x. And hopefully we would end up with something close to the exact solution of two zero. If we naively just invert that matrix and try and solve it, we end up with a really, really crappy solution. It's blown up. And the reason is we have this tiny value in the matrix that we divided by, and it blew up the noise tremendously, and we get this very, very poor quality solution. This is typical of, of every inverse problem, actually, and you see this a lot. And it turns out that projection methods can be used to re dramatically reduce the sensitivity of noise to problems like this. And we could use a variety of projection methods, including PCA-based methods or the lasso, for example, because we have a, a linear system here. And in projection methods of both, if you used either the lasso or a principal components-based technique, what they would do is approximate that inverse matrix by picking one of the columns, an important column in the matrix, the first one, and getting rid of the column that had that tiny value in it. That's what both of those methods would do. And then there's a weird inverse there that I don't want to talk about, 
Basically, it says don't divide by zero, that's all. And if we, if we apply this regularized solution that was projected into a one-dimensional problem of a single column, then uh, we, we get a solution that's very close to the one that we would like. And that's, uh, that's how projection methods can be used to uh, help improve the quality of answers. And here are a couple of our packages um, that are super useful for doing these kinds of things. There's a package called IRLBA, which is extremely efficient at computing large-scale principal components for dense or sparse problems. Um, and of course, uh, the GLM net package, if you happen to have a linear system of equations, uh, I'm sure most of you have used this package. It's a superb approach at picking out important columns in a linear system. Now, most of you maybe don't think of GLM net or the lasso as a projection method, but it when used only in lasso form, that's exactly what it is. We're just picking out a subset of the columns of, of our problem and projecting the problem onto those. Uh, and finally, I'll give you a, another real-world example of how projection methods can be used in, in, in the real world in this context, um, just pr from principal components. Uh, so this is, uh, these are some data from the Thousand Genomes Project, uh, just chromosome 8. Uh, so the Thousand Genomes Project collects uh, full genomic sequences of about 2,500 people. And it distills those down into things called variants, which are like diffs of one human from another. And we are surprisingly similar and by that measure. They're, they're only about 0.1% of our DNA varies from person to person. Um, and, and then you end up with these things called variants. And here are all the variants from this me these measurements uh, for one chromosome of the genome. And uh, you end up with this matrix that's 2,500 rows by four and a half million columns or so, but it's very, very sparse. And you can actually, using the IRLBA package, uh, compute the principal components of that problem, of, of that size, in like a minute on a, on a laptop, if you just want three principal components. And, and a projection onto three principal components tells you quite a bit, actually. Uh, so here's a plot of this uh, that got mangled a little bit. But I've colored them by um, uh, uh, ethnicity data, uh, these superpopulations, they call them, in the Thousand Genome Project. And you can see that the colors match the clusters that are produced by the principal components algorithm fairly accurately. So in other words, even after the diffing and the variant calculation, you can project human DNA down to just a, a, a scatter plot in 3D and tell a lot about the differences between people. So you can really cut data down to size to compute with it very effectively if you use these packages. Okay, so that was a lot about projections. I just want to encourage you to think in those terms, or hopefully you already do. And uh, remember that projections can help you search for solutions in spaces that make the problem easy to solve, even if it's a seemingly huge problem. And sometimes approximation methods actually can work to your benefit, which might be counterintuitive to some of you, and you might, might want to consider that, especially if you have an inverse problem. Um, and that's it about projections. I, I have, uh, uh, you know, in the interest of time, you can only talk about so much, and I really wanted to emphasize projections. But um, there are other really cool ways to think about big data that I'm a huge fan of. Um, and one of those is the divide and recombine approach, which is a very different approach than projection, uh, which is best uh, exemplified by Michael Jordan's big data bootstrap, which some of you may use already. And it's a wonderful way to look at uh, 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 variation of parameters in, in different models. And uh, a really exciting thing is to just change the, the base in which you're looking at the solution. And there's some work by some folks at Microsoft Research for linear mixed effects models that is uh, super fast, and that's a problem that we don't ever think of as being solvable in a fast way, and it's really cool stuff, uh, but it's very limited right now. I think it would be an excellent project for some of you to continue, actually. They need, they need some, uh, some, more, some more work in that area. So I just wanted to bring those to your attention. And that's it. Thank you very much for having me here again. Thank you.